Okay, um, we're just about to start introductions. Okay, so glad that you are here. Um, I'm Roseanne Reynolds. I'm part of the Post Qualitative Research Collective. I, I know some of the people in the room, but I don't know some of the other people. So, um, yeah, <laughs> if that helps. But I am finished my PhD in 2021, and I work at UCT in the School of Education. My particular interest is childhood studies, but I also work in initial teacher education. So yeah, I'm also one of the authors in the book, as it goes across your screen, and I'm quite happy, really use Karen Barad's work pretty deeply for my PhD. So I'm very happy to be, um, you know, thinking about this book with different authors in this way, people that I've come to know quite well. So I'd like us to maybe just go around the room and introduce ourselves. I know some of you know each other quite well. Um, and then we can start with, um, I'll admit, Tundiwe, and then we'll we'll together decide on how we're going to do this in the same way that Teresa difficultated last week and sort of allowed the group to share and decide how to proceed. Thanks. So anyone is looking, Ezra, I don't know you, but you're looking quite engaged and you're nodding <laughs> <laughs> so you can go next <laughs> thanks sure definitely following along with everything that's happening so far <laughs> um yeah uh, my name is Ezra I'm at Tufts University I'm a grad student writing my dissertation on um post-humanism in some stem ed contexts um and trying to do post-qualitative research Oh. And just remind me, where, which context are you in? Where, which part of the world? Sorry. Oh, yes. Tufts University, sorry, is in uh, the United States in Massachusetts. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. And Ezra, you can find another participant who you'd like to call on. Oh, sure. Uh, how about Teresa? Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name's Teresa Fiorza. I'm um, in Johannesburg. I'm based at the School of Education at the University of the Witwatersrand, where I work in um, childhood studies and arts education. And um, yeah, I also worked with um, Karen Barad's work for my PhD, which I finished in 2018. Um, and um, then wrote a book, uh, 2021. So um it's called oh yeah learning with damaged colonial places thanks pleasure thanks Teresa. do you want to grab someone else bogdana <laughs> hi um yeah i'm bogdana i'm um, currently a master's student i study um outdoor and experiential education and um, this is how i came um to find a lot of the topics that I would have never otherwise come across, um, such as post-humanism, the post-human world, and um, anything post-qual as well, post-qualitative. Um, I am in the process of, or just about to start my um, dissertation, which I am um, thinking to write about and write with um, different ecologies and um, also uh, consider the intersectionality of disability studies and queer bodies and how those enable different realities. Um, so I'm not sure what's going to come out of it, as you never are, but I'm excited to start it and I've come across this collective and definitely wanted to get more insight from people who have been doing it for longer, I guess. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Bogdana. And you can you choose somebody else in the screen on the screen? Yeah, um, I can choose Arkadia. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Arkadi. Um, I'm a used to be a student on the same master's uh, course as Bogdana. Um, I actually just finished my uh, my um, um, degree. I uh, just finished writing my dissertation, uh, got the feedback uh, back as well. Um, I wrote my um, uh, dissertation uh, on writing. Um, I wrote quite extensively with uh, um, Elizabeth St. Pierre um, mm -hmm. and uh, Gilles Deleuze. She um, was a big uh, influence for me. So I was, I was trying to uh, essentially queer um, outdoor studies in, in my dissertation in a way. Um, advocating for, you know, the uh, idea that um, 
textual journeys could be just as experiential as uh, physical journeys in, in the outdoors. <clears throat> wow. um, yeah, um, I'll, uh, uh, how about uh, uh, George, is that, is that correct? Yeah. Hello. Hi, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I am the research assistant for the post qualitative research collective and also the sort of adjacent overlapping project of decolonizing early childhood discourses. Um, so all of the reading groups um, and these kinds of events, um, I help to organize and uh, know, sort of do all the technical things and that kind of thing. And I realize I'm still wearing this because we just started a, well, I just started as a researcher for the Lego project, uh, a project being done by Lego, looking at like um, the impact of um, gaming, particularly we're using iPads, but the impact of gaming on children's well-being. So I do a lot of things, but that's one of the things I'm doing. So maybe I should actually take this off. School visitor. <laughs> <laughs> some way to use well, it, it was know. cool i made uh eight really good new new friends today so it was a good day good <laughs> george can you choose someone else please oh please. yeah joanne let's hear thank you sorry i fell out because of, um load shedding <laughs> and my imac just died so i'm on my my macbook hi everybody um my name is Joanne Pierce, and I'm pleased to be here. Um, I work as the head of academics at an institution called the Center for Creative Education. We have a few qualifications that we offer for, yeah, for teachers and those who are um, also working towards dance qualifications. Um, I'm working on my PhD currently, and very, um, very glad to be a part of this community because I'm really focusing on relational philosophies and how that can help us to rethink um, environmental education. I'm not Thanks. sure who hasn't uh, gone. Tandiwe and Barry haven't been yet, so you can decide. Tandiwe! Thanks. Hello, hello everyone. I'm not my usual public self today. <laughs> my name is Otan Diwe. I'm based in Johannesburg. Um, at the same institution where Teresa is, at Wirtz, I'm a confused PhD student attempting to entangle myself with these post humanist quantum ideas. So my big thing is really about how do we keep the physics, physics while we're disrupting <laughs> all these concepts. So I was sitting for an hour in a call with Teresa, trying to break down my study and we, aren't you tired, Teresa? I, I'm not. I'm not here yet. <laughs> so yeah, I'm very privileged. I think we have, I feel very privileged to have met a group like this, and looking forward to today's engagements. So thanks, Barry. Hi, Tony. <laughs> um, I got hit by um, load shedding as well. My um, internet might just be too bad completely. But um, Tandi, I would love to have a conversation with you because I think our conversation this morning at um, MUH was very interesting. But anyway, that's a separate thing. My name is Barry Lewis. I'm currently in Cape Town. Um, I've been part of the um, Meeting Universe Halfway um, Collective or reading group um, for a while now. Um, really enjoy starting the week like that. And um, yeah, and uh, focus, I'm, I'm an architect from the UK, I've done, spent 10 years in an informal community, um, also known as the Zinc Forest in, in Philippi, and using post-humanism, agential realism, uh, and post-human methodologies to think differently about um, the Zinc Forest and maybe um, ways of making home in a context like the apartheid city. So um, very, Happy to be here and always happy to engage um, in this conversation. Thanks, Betty. Um, Betty, I think it's just Anya who's just joined us. Um, and hopefully we're just doing introductions at the moment. Anya says she's just gone to fetch her book in the okay. car, from the car. Fine. I actually had a quick question um, and sorry to ask 
but I, if you don't want to say it doesn't matter it, that's fine but I'm quite interested in place and location so sorry Bogdan if you did tell us where you're from but or where you dialing in from today I suppose that's more specific and then maybe Arkady or and also just something with I'm listening and trying to be on zoom and then possibly not remembering the way to pronounce your name so if you could just tell us where you are located at the moment so Bogdan do you want to start or just tell us um, yeah, I'm currently in London. Um, I forgot to say sorry. And then um, I am completing my degree remotely now as I'm done with all the classes. But my degree took place in the Lake District in Cumbria in the United Kingdom as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, so, so I, I, I did my master's also in Cumbria, um, Lake District, uh, but I'm from uh, Moldova. Um, I was uh, in the UK for a year and a half on a, um, a scholarship program. Uh, so I just returned home a few weeks back. And um, this, is, this is actually really exciting to, uh, um, to be uh, taking part in this, uh, this call because, um, um, I don't know, it's... Uh, um, I remember coming across this uh, concept somewhere in my readings, um, islands of stability, you know, but uh, uh, probably the opposite of that would, would you know, um, describe um, the sort of gatherings, um, if I may call them that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I really, really uh, enjoy um, uh, being here today and especially having so many people from um, uh, early childhood education and uh, education as a general. Um, yeah, thank you. And please some congratulations on completing your master's. Well done on that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, and I think we know everybody else is, but hi, Veronica, if you want to just introduce yourself and then Anya will do that afterwards if she's back from fetching her book. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. I've just popped in. I saw the link coming on, and um, but I'm going to keep my video off, but um, I look forward to the session. Thanks. Thanks, Veronica. And I'm from, Alton... Cape, I'm from Cape Town, yeah. <laughs> and you can tell us what your PhD was about if you'd like, Veronica, but you don't have to. Okay, just quickly. It was yeah. from uh, around undergraduate medical students learning in obstetrics and how they witness a lot of violences. So that's, and um, Karen Barad's work was very useful in thinking differently. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Veronica. Hi, Anya, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, yeah. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Anya Martin. I'm based in Cape Town, Kamisa, South Africa. Um, I'm in my third year of doing my PhD, hopefully my final year. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it's on uh, co-creating a pedagogy of care for our marine environment. Um, but alongside that, I um, am very interested in women leadership in conservation. So I work for an organization called Women for the Environment in Africa. And I also work for another one called Homeward Bound, and that's more at an international level. And again, women leadership in STEM specifically, science, technology, engineering, maths, and medicine. And I also started a little nonprofit organization called the Beach Co-op. So that's the suite of things I'm involved in. Fantastic. Thanks. I think we've we've sort of laid the ground for a context of where we are and what we're doing, and not that that's all of who we are. But um, I'd like to give a special welcome to Joanne today. We had some different ideas, well, not all of us, but some <laughs> about should the authors be at the, I think it's a lovely idea that the authors can be here. I was at a um, strategic planning session last week and I couldn't be here. Um, and Adrian possibly has also made that choice, but we have the authors work with us. And so we've got it, well, I've got my book and I've, we have it on screen, so I'm happy to share. And then also just to get a sense from this community as we navigate the next hour together, um, kind of if we want to start with a particular we can start with Joanne's chapter and then move over on to Adrian's later and then maybe possibly and we'll diffract and think through their work so if people are happy with that what we'll do are people happy with that I do tend to talk and not wait for the <laughs> replies <laughs> um yeah any other comments certainly please jump in but I'll share my screen and then we can share the chapter called Teal, which is not that one. Okay, it's Ultramarine. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, I don't know. Oh, wait, why are they both? Sorry, I'm doing the same thing twice, but I'm wondering if. Oh, yeah, that's. Are both? Sorry, why am I? I have both as Ultramarine. Why do I have that? Sorry, I was reading them in my book. 
does somebody have the let me stop sharing does somebody have it online that they'd like to share or do you want me to carry on looking i thought i'd just i uh, got it down i can also send it to you if you have okay i've got it now i'm sorry i've got it up now i don't know why i was opening the same thing yeah yeah no thank you thanks so much george i was hoping you'd there we go okay cool so um we don't have to start at the beginning of a chapter because that's not necessarily the way we best want to understand or not understand something. So are there any, does anybody want to start in a particular place in this chapter or would you like to start reading from the beginning? Are there any um, special ideas around that? Okay, are we happy to start at the beginning? <laughs> yeah, I think so because it, it's Thanks. what I like, yeah, what I liked about this is the way that you you don't go anyway, you you you're continually jumping into the footnotes, which is great. Yeah, that is a comment. It, yeah, it's it's quite something we you recognize and realize that's what we're doing. Um thanks, Nandi. We have got a hands up there, a thumb up at least. So do we have a volunteer to start reading this chapter, please? I can read. Thanks, Teresa. Chapter Teal, researching research, troubling lines as a world in practice. Joanne Pierce. Researching research. In this chapter, I focus on what Karen Barad's interactive relational philosophy offers as a way of thinking about research. Through Barad's relational philosophy, I now recognize the ethical and epistemological need for troubling the assumed boundaries between relationships and thinking with researching as relational. The entanglement of thoughts, sensations, and memories are within every detail visible, invisible, and yet to be noticed in this chapter. The chapter text, images, and QR code sounds move and slip through and beyond the pages, which is a deliberate way of disrupting spatial borders in academic writing. Inspired by the significance of footnotes for Karen Barad in their writing and how we work with them in the reading groups, footnotes deserve special attention. Footnotes, a note, but not in the way that the footnote, maybe, maybe it'd be great if I can read with someone and then have yeah. a different voice reading the footnotes. What do you think? Good idea. Do we have a footnote, a volunteer to be the footnotes? <laughs> I'm happy to do footnotes. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> so you can start at number one. First, Teresa must say footnotes. <laughs> footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> a note, but not in the way that the foot is at the bottom of the human body. As I type, I feel the sand from the garden and residue of the salty ocean water under my feet. The breath of 40, the great day, covers my toes at times. These are the sticky memories of what and who I am walking with. This is more like what footnotes are to me, a way of making writing voice and matter porous, a vibrant apparatus for churning like water waves do. Leave clues of the leaky traces of thought and keep this chapter from getting trapped in the boundaries of linear time. Not first. I ignore the autocorrect that tries to fix my fight against the number sequence, the traditional step-by-step -step first, second, and third in an academic chapter. It keeps doing this with other words too, these blue rippled lines trying to keep me inside the bounded lines of its English. The blue ripples travel with me into sensation into sensations of swimming, temporal and spatial diffraction. I briefly discuss 
my experience of the constructed boundary lines that exist through the separation of researching as a student at university and the personal relations with the time. word personal is already assumed to belong to or be part of an individual body i actually prefer disembodied uh, personal relations with time place swimming family and spirituality though darkness was present before the world and all things were created it, it is equated with matter the maternal the germinal the potential and zadra the world was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters genesis 1 1 that tend to be excluded from serious academic pursuits definitely not second i return Karen Barad explains the difference between returning and returning through the familiar visual metaphors of reflection and diffraction. Returning is associated with reflection, how light returns from where it came from, from, from where it came once it hits the mirror, while returning is about diffracting. Thus, if returning implies a going back in time to what once was in linear time, returning in research involves always already being entangled with in a world that is not a distance. To the seminar with Karen Barad at Monkey Valley, which has had a specific influence on my journey in disrupting the assumed separateness of relations. I'm discovering more ways to question and reconfigure research practice as entangled relations through returning to the seminar the reading groups where we discuss, where we continue to read their work and the decolonizing early childhood discourses, research groups, engagements with other water, researchers, practitioners, professors, kin. By kin, I mean those who have an enduring mutual obligatory non-optional, you can't just cast that away when it gets inconvenient, relatedness that carries consequences. I have a cousin, the cousin has me. I have a dog, a dog has me. I have a garden and the garden has me. The seeding of seeds, the flourishing of leaves, the salty ocean breeze, composting earthworms. Writers and academics, returning. Barad explains returning as a multiplicity of processes, such as the kinds earthworms revel in while helping to make compost or otherwise being busy at work and at play. An imagery of the soil being turned over and over with it being ingested and excreted. This is a lively affair of an earthworm tunneling through it, burrowing all means of aerating the soil, allowing oxygen in, opening it up and breathing new life into it. Becomes a generative method of troubling these boundary lines of research and reimagining these lines as entangled permeable and relational. Within my current PhD research, I blur the boundary lines of being a student as separate from everyday relations. Following the entangled lines of the relational philosophy. Agental realism is different from other relational conceptual frameworks. For Barad, intraaction signifies the mutual constitution of infinitely entangled agencies unlike the concept of interaction. Interaction starts with things in relation to one another, whereas intraaction starts with relations. Agential of agential realism, time is revealed as leaky. Time is out of joint. It is diffracted, broken apart in different directions, non-contemporaneous, with itself, each moment is an infinite multiplicity. Is not linear, but a multiplicity of past, present and future. Leaking time is a moving and intertwining of time that articulates different sensibilities of time and actively disrupts the bounded world of academia as separate or at a distance from other relations. 
Not always, thirdly, I write with the entangled lines of the university library and local library to articulate the entangled nature of relations in generating research practices, ideas, curiosities, and research making. Finally, this chapter draws on Donna Haraway's concept of worlding and Tim Ingold's philosophy of lines. Ingold suggests that the subject of lines is in fact a part of everyday life and dynamic in its relation with the world. It includes walking, weaving, observing, singing, storytelling, drawing, and writing. I draw attention to the permeable boundaries between research and disembodied relations within my ongoing PhD research project as an opportunity for engaging in research as a worlding practice. Entanglements of histories, time, space, sound, texts, themes, QR codes, writing, swimming, movement, readers, and imagining form, uh, imagining form the per performativity of research as a worlding practice. Thanks, Teresa. I think I'm going to ask if we can just pause and um, and while we're thinking about what settles or what has unsettled us or what's dropping for us, um, Ariel, I noticed that Karen's in the room, so maybe Karen can introduce herself and then we can just start thinking about um, maybe sharing something about what we've just heard. So. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. yeah. Apologies for coming in later. Um, it was I was in a school, so I rushed back. But <laughs> traffic was a problem. Where during load shedding, then the, the traffic lights don't work, so it took much longer than I expected. So um, it's wonderful to be here, and a, a really amazing actually to to see this this see a chapter of this book being discussed and uh, being read in this way and uh, yeah I'm really excited about that you want me to yes. say more who I am maybe okay. just who you are and where you oh. are in the world at the moment <laughs> I am in St James's in Cape Town right at this moment doing um involved in four research projects and uh, I am Emerita Professor at UCT. I'm a co-editor and co-author uh, of uh, chapters in this book and co-editor of the book and chief uh, editor of the series in which this is the book. And um, my daily bread I earn through being a professor of early childhood education at the University of Oulu in the north, north of Inland, where the temperature is is the same, but an under zero, and uh, so it's good to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, we've had Barry as the footnote or the footnotes, and we've had Teresa as the as the reader. So, does anybody want to kick us off with a comment or just a thought that they that struck them over these couple of pages? Well, first, I just love uh, reading in this way. I was thinking about how nice it is to have the footnotes at the bottom of the page rather than the end notes, and how just having two voices read the footnotes, mm -hmm. like, you know, squishes that space together even more so that your brain doesn't have to break even to sort of scan to the bottom of the page. It's really nice. <clears throat> I was mm -hmm. wanting to. I was, it made me think about writing with like footnotes in the middle um, of the text. Can I just follow on from that? Because I, what, I, what I really love about it is that it is a, an enactment of the way the footnotes work with Karen Barad, but very explicitly. And so that whole thing about how the very often the lesser important things are in the footnotes, but actually really the important things are here in the footnote, like in Meeting the Universe Halfway. And it's it's just a wonderful way of working with footnotes. And then the ex the other thing is that you know the thing about foot and feet, you know, is so uh, often ignored and, and not noticed. And if you start to notice feet and how they move, 
in, uh, in research, uh, what else is going on in rooms, classrooms, of, in, in any phases of education, or um, you see very different things. So, and I think that's also how it works in this chapter. You notice very different things. So really enjoy that. Mm. Lo lovely choice. Thanks, Ken. Teresa, do you look like you were... I just, <laughs> like the, I just like the word leaking. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose, you know, it's almost like the stuff has leaked down to the bottom of the page. <laughs> yeah we just remind us where joanne uses leaking or maybe joanne remembers but it's well um, yeah, on the first page footnotes leave clues of the leaky traces of thought yeah and keep this chapter from being trapped in the boundary sorry Teresa, of linear time that's on page mm, mm, leaky there and then on page 93 there's more leaking yeah yeah revealed leaky, as yeah. leaky time leaking time is a moving and intertwining of time yeah. Great. So uh, sorry, somebody oh, sorry, somebody asking something. Right. Cool. Okay, are we happy to carry on with um concrete time or do you want to keep going with where we were? From where we were, sorry, I meant. Um, I think what would be good is to, I don't know where we are with the time, but what we did last week was we um, then went on to the next chapter and read some of that and then came back to um, to the previous chapter. So we kind of read in a diffractive way. Yeah, we've got a little bit, we've got till top is fine. So we, let's decide as a, yeah, I mean, I'm happy. Thank you for any suggestions about how this will work in this community. So we've got till half past five to go between the two chapters. So we could do a little more, Joanne, or we can go to Adrian's one now. Is that what you, I'm happy to do that as well. I'm yeah. Easy. Okay, let, let's go jump into Adrian's then and then we can jump between the two. Is that, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to read. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Let me just, Try and do that more. And then we need a we need a, a foot. <laughs> Anybody Another willing? Foot there. Oh my gosh, this is definitely called something else. Let me just stop sharing for a minute and call it up properly. Um I seem to have. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, who'd like to be the footnote person? This one. Do we have a volunteer? Someone wants to be the body of the text. I'm happy to be the foot. <laughs> One. I'll I'll be the footnotes. It's also okay. Good. Thanks. Chapter Ultramarine on aftermaths, after lives, and after images. Um, Adrian van Eden Wharton. Landfall. The air is chilly, damp. The ground still wet a respite from the gale force northwesterly winds and heavy rains that caused flash floods a few days earlier, displacing hundreds of families from their homes in, in Imizamayetu. Imizamayetu, Isikosa meaning through our collective efforts, is a township in Hart Bay near Cape Town, an exemplar of the extreme contrast, continued socioeconomic inequality and spatial segregation in South Africa. Large sections of Imazama Yetu remain without formal infrastructure and thousands of residents had already lost their homes in devastating fires three months earlier. On the opposite side of the Chapman's Peak section of the Table Mountain National Park, Worlds apart from the conference facilities at the Monkey Valley Beach Nature Resort, yet only a short drive away via a toll road overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, carved into the steep rock face and built by penal labor a century ago. While high swells and rain bearing storms are characteristic of the maritime climate of the Southern Cape Peninsula, the cold fronts that have had made landfall over three consecutive winters were too few too infrequent. During the workshop, shifting attentions and generative conversations turn and return to palpable experience of winter weather, wind wave interactions, flows, eddies, and the movements of unnoticed currents. 
the looming multi-year drought in the Western Cape and unprecedented water shortages in the Cape Town metropolitan, soon escalating to the anticipation of a dreaded day zero when municipal taps would run dry, seemed almost inconceivable. Agential realism, Karen Barad reminds us, is not a static givenness. Their readings at the workshop of diffracting diffraction, cutting together apart, and an early version of troubling times and ecologies of nothingness, returning, remembering, and facing the incalculable. Neither formal conference presentations nor staged performance lectures and the resonant troublings that follow stay with me, move with me, a murmur, an echo, refolding and retreating, overlapping and doubling up like ocean waves. How can I be responsible for that which I love? As I stray and circle back, touching on aspects of salt water bodies from an atlas of loss. Salt water bodies from an atlas of loss was originally a practice as research PhD, Stellenbosch University, supervised by Elizabeth Gunter, to whom I am deeply indebted. This chapter in part draws on the dissertation from Eden Wharton, 2020, alongside water log, I'm developing salt water bodies into a larger body of creative work. And new ongoing work, water log. My hope is that this chapter two signals an unsettled conversation in progress on the inseparability of time and justice, grappling with complicity and heightened precarity the unfinished labors of mourning and witnessing and the yearning towards more wakeful and just planetary futures. There are no solutions, Barad suggests. There's only the ongoing practice of being open and alive to each meeting, each interaction, so that we might use our ability to respond, our responsibility to help awaken, to breathe life into ever new possibilities for living justly. Shaped by years of walking and immersion and submersion in the cold waters of the Benguela current, salt water bodies is a response through photo media sh media shins. So um, Joanna Zalinska proposes the conceptual framework of photo mediations as a processual, dynamic, and relational understanding of photo media as a complex light-based phenomena. I use the modified punctuation photo mediations to evoke the affect, affective and aesthetical praxis of creating and engaging with still moving images. Wow. And, and, <laughs> and live art to encounters along the shores of the Atlantic Ocean of the Southern, the South African West Coast and adjacent, uh, adjacent islands. Earthly stretches of loss and in exchange these terra, terra aqueous sites are haunted by violent legacies, unchecked environmental exploitation and indifference. Shadow places where histories of indiscriminate, increasingly systematic killing and ecological destruction, such as the harvesting of whales, seals, seabirds, and guano are inseparable from settler colonialisms, empire, state control, racial segregation, land dispossession, coercive labor practices, militarization and industrialization. Sure, I need to take a breath. Can someone? I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a um, let's yeah. have a little moment. And I was I just was thinking while we're thinking about this, let me just introduce Adrian just from her um brief memo, uh, sorry memo from a brief bio. Um Adrian van Eden Wharton is an artist researcher who is passionate about finding ways of restoring fraught and entangled, entangled terra aqueous multi species relatings. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pretoria, South Africa, on the Antarctica, Africa, and the Arts Project, funded by the National Research Foundation as part of the South African National Antarctic Program. So that just gives you a bit of context um, as to whose work we're reading. Okay, so um, are they, but I mean, yeah, her work is, yeah, you know, there's a lot to be affected by. Would anybody like to comment on something that struck them or something they're puzzled by or interested in? Or 
connect with. Rosanna, I wonder um, if it's just, it'd be SF worth just finishing that section. PhD. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, Barry, you and Joanna are crossing. Joanna, do you want to say something? Uh, Barry is suggesting that we finish the section, which I also possibly think is a good idea. Yeah. But Joanne, did you just need um, a break? No, I just needed a breath. That was a lot to read in that I last. I know. It, yeah. Um, Would somebody else like to read and we can get to the end of the section because that possibly is what... Um, <laughs> Do we have a volunteer? I'll read. Thank you. Thanks, Ezra. I'll continue with the footnotes. They're not too many. So from right. Val Plumwood, thanks. Val Plumwood's concept of shadow or denied places, multiple disregarded places of economic and ecological support, unrecognized materially supportive places that are likely to elude our knowledge and responsibility is a cogent evocation of the making invisible and distant of oceanic ecocide across multiple registers. Further south all too often means farther out of sight. Waterlogged then takes this research further south. See also Meg Samuelson and Shawnee Lavery's proposition for an oceanic south. As I follow material and geopolitical flows in the enduring aftermaths of colonialism, extractivism, and military industrial expansion. From the mainland shores and islands along the southern African coast to the pelagic and benthic zones of the South Atlantic, South Indian, and Southern Oceans, the sub-Antarctic islands, and finally to the frozen ends of the earth, Antarctica. The Southern Cape Peninsula, where Monkey Island, Monkey Valley is located, is marked by intertwined histories that are not dissimilar. And as with many coastal regions in South Africa, this includes not only separating entire communities from the ocean through forced removals and segregated beaches during apartheid, but also continued economic disparities. While the unique location of the conference facilities, generous hospitality of the staff, and thick material discursive connections enlivened by careful responses all contribute to a capacious more than academic workshop experience. The exclusivity of the venue and elevated position on the mountainside from where one can look down onto the beach and out over the ocean are stark reminders of privilege, occupation, and distance. Mm. Thank you. Something that um, that became quite um, noticeable for me is um, in reading Adrian's work in this in this book. I mean, I'm I'm reading it in the mm. you know the hard book um, paperback in my hand. Um, how much? Yeah, it's quite soothing for me to to be able to register how I know her PhD. I've seen the visual uh, photography work that she submitted for a PhD. I've heard her present in different at different points, you know, having been there at um, in reading groups years ago at UCT when it was still in the early early times and and then also just listening to her speak about it recently. I'm soothed by that sensation that as PhD researchers or as researchers, when we when we write something or when we produce a publication, whether it's in text or in other shapes and forms, there are other ways that our, not our work, but the work that we're involved in is constantly diffracted through. So as, as I was re reading, I think I was more affected, not by the words of colonial or settler colonialisms or racial segregation, but because it was that intertwined with, with walking parts of that coast myself or 
sharing some of of the stories and the and the the images and footage that that aren't necessarily included yeah and i found that quite encouraging um to have that that feeling um as as a phd student myself you know that kind of a resting feeling where you feel like you need to put everything in and then they, they they read this one sentence but they must also know this and this and this and this and how it is it's a moving it's moving it's on the move and i like how she speaks about the murmur and the echo refolding retreating overlapping and doubling up i feel like that's what was happening for me um with her work mm. and can i can i also say that um uh, the website that goes with the book or let's say the books in the with the series um that it isn't there yet but that soon i hope um the the images will also be put onto the website so that these amazing images and the way um adrian also submitted them she submitted them in color and she submitted them in in black and white to make sure that the way they were reproduced would be at their best but you know they are absolutely amazing and when you see them in color and and, and big so um, especially if you're thinking of reading this in uh, or presenting this at, um, you know with your own students or want to use it in any other way then they will be in there and also there will be podcasts that go with it so that's also how this series works so that's not just the 2d in the book but that there is going to be something else later on and that's also part of the book launch at the end of of this month um so mm. you know to doing those tapes and then it's going to be all on the website so but i totally agree with you you know how stunning Mm. And, and also, I think the, the importance of these images is to affect, you know, it is an effective encounter with a visual and therefore, and I know Roseanne, you've, you've so often spoke about that, you know, how the words are still so privileged over mm. the visual by publishers and by, you know, people who publish journals and authors it's very frustrating when your work is so visual and and not as a way of illustrating the words but actually um doing something to you as a reader um mm. but despite that you know i think they work really well in the chapter but they yeah it could be so much better if we had a different yeah. media yeah. so that's that's still in the making <laughs> <laughs> Cool. I also want to just comment on this in this section of the book. I made some notes about um just tie up on page 106. The oh and sorry, thanks, Karen, firstly, for your for your comment. And be glad that that's going to be available because it is important when you think about um Adrian's work. I also have that feeling of also, I think because I have met Adrian and I went to the place where she did her PhD research. Well, one of the one of the sites we went to the beach and, and acted with her, which was really very powerful. But also, when you think about, we know this concept, or I suppose we know the concept. But she she writes through it here, yeah, the inseparability of time and justice near the top of this page, where she says we're grappling with complexity and heightened precarity, the unfinished labors of mourning, and so you know, thinking about the particular work she's doing and what she's trying to say about that, and then. So that's something um, you know, always being reminded when it's when you think of Barad, or when I think about Karen Barad's work, the idea of this inseparability of time and justice, and and Adrian really shows that throughout this chapter, and then um, just this very small sentence further down where she talks about further south in the last paragraph on page one hundred and six, all too often means farther out of sight. That is very striking in terms of the global north and the global south and you know when we think of what happened with COVID what happens but then also with the animals and with certainly the animals that what, what Adrian tends to work with which are the carcasses of these animals so also further south and then further out of sight just this idea of um, light and dark shadow and darkness um, and sight which is very interesting as well so I'm saying lots of different things but I'm just sort of sharing some of what I was affected by and then also when you think of sight the photo mediations <laughs> the concept is really very powerful um yeah live art encounters along that's again in the middle of the page yeah so just it's a lot to be provoked by I think in this piece and certainly just in the little section we've read I don't know if anyone else wants to um 
comment. And then, I mean, I'm now going to have to try and remind myself looking at time. So methodologically, we were talking about the footnotes in Joanne and they work slightly differently here, but certainly um, I was it Ezra was saying the reading them together makes really changes. You Now you realize we may need always to be reading with more than one person, <laughs> even when we're alone. Um, so I'm going to suggest we hold on to Adrian's work and we jump back. So give me a second as I navigate my computer and let's find ourselves back in Joanne's piece and see where we can go with that. That's the one, okay. And Joanne, we're gonna move into concrete time with you now, so. Yeah. From a, from a technical point of view, I just wanted to ask a question around footnotes and word counts <laughs> and um, how that works. Do you get to hide your number of words in your footnotes or do they count? Busted, Joanne, busted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as a the PhD student <laughs> is asking a serious question. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a very serious question it because is, like, is you, know, you could go on forever if you wanted to. But uh, no, it, well, the answer is that there's no universal rule around it. So you will have to ask in terms of where it is that you're wanting to use footnotes, because in some paper publications it counts as it counts in other places it doesn't. So it's the not, leaky boundary. It's not always um, <laughs> yeah, it's not always a given that it's either, I suppose it's also like in some cases when abstracts are counted as part of, of the work as well. So mm -hmm. the, sorry, the short answer is it depends. <laughs> I suppose you're for your PhD, Anya, you're asking, I mean, it's quite, um, Judy Crowther, who writes incredibly, also had, so, you know, her PhD also has, which I highly recommend everybody reads, she also really spends a lot of time you, um, writing in the footnotes, talking through a theory there. Slightly differently, actually, to the way you're doing it, Joanne, where, where your voice comes out in your footnotes. So it's almost like the thinking and then the being and the embodiedness is in your footnotes. Um, Judy uses it slightly differently. But, Anya, it may be worthwhile asking your checking with your institution, because to my knowledge, I'm thinking they don't count the footnotes because when you ask to submit it for turn it in or whatever you ask to, you know, so it may be a way to. Yeah, I'm doing mine by um, publication though. So I suppose it will oh, depend on the yeah. publications. Um, so I'm doing papers. Yeah. I just so want to follow up on that. Yeah. So some, yeah. And so that means that depending on what special issue or who you're submitting to, they will have different regulations. For me, they count. I count them because they do count and so they they're not hidden or uh, and so I'm working within that tension of they matter as much as the body of text matters so they are part of the number count and the word count and so when I'm choosing to expand on a footnote I'm doing that with the tension of knowing that it mm. it's not yeah it's what is a part of and and so it is included here in, in word count. Um, and a lot of that I've got from, from um, uh, Catherine McKittrick's work on citations. And the other one is, um, ooh, what's her name? Um, I'm seeing a book in front of me. Uh, she draws on um, Stephanie Springer's work and she also writes about footnotes or, you know, the, the political work of citations being the things that you, that are quotations that afford you the opportunity to make the argument that you're making in the text. So the flipping around of that, that it's not only that footnotes are the things that allow you, the, the foundations that allow you to say what you want to say in your chapter, but it's also a place where the voice lives across both spaces. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks for um, clarifying and expressing that it's essential to the work of your, of your work. Um, I'm happy to read, but I also okay. want you to share the, the thesis that you mentioned um, earlier that we should yeah. all read. Uh, have you got a copy to share with us? Or? Uh, yeah, it's on. Um, it's at UCT's. Uh, yeah, I can. I can get a copy. I can share a copy. I will ask George to. That would be amazing. Thank oh. you. Okay. Um, okay, and then do we have somebody who's happy to be the footnote? So we're moving from 
let's keep Adrian's work in tension with the or not in tension in <laughs> ebb and flow with what we're reading now. <laughs> Thanks. Is somebody willing to be a footnote on this one? Um, Bogdana, are you just adjusting your position? Or you, okay, thanks. Or, I think um, okay, also, thanks. Roseanne. Oh, yeah, Barry, yeah. Um, I quite like the way that number 10 starts on page 93 and it continues on 94. So I actually missed that bit. So the, the rest of number okay. 10 has to be picked up by the new footnote person, please. Okay. So Bogdana will start with a Barry lift off this. Sorry, Bogdan, I'm trying to unmute you, but <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. Um, we're going to end, we're going to start with a little bit of um, the footnote 10, which Barry left off. So maybe, Bogdan, you can start with that, with the rest of footnote 10 on page 90. I can't even see the bottom of the page. And then we'll, um, Anya will start with concrete time on bottom of 94 again. So, Bogdan, if you want to start with the footnote 10, thanks. Sorry, let me just make sure that I see everything. These lines are part of welding, which produces ideas and possibilities for disrupting the bounded lines that separate relations and pays attention to bodies in relation with the world. Thank you. Concrete time. Universities exist with theoretical frameworks and practices that influence the very nature of what it means to be a student and an academic. In teacher education, educational research is conducted within predetermined, categorized, and bounded epistemic fields. Envi for example, environmental, language, literacy, mathematics. These categorizations separate and cut up education research and furthermore produce determinate boundaries for research practices. Academic disciplines, language, and conventions are some of the structural lines that constitute the academic framework in the university. These structural lines intertwine with dominant theories and practices, divide and create borders for research. I return to my registration for a master's in primary education, which meant that I had to write with specific educational theories and fit into this stream where categorizations, Categor categorizations are demarcations bounded by which, by which epistemologies are included, e.g. curriculum and policies in education and which are excluded, e.g. more than human. Already made. This required linear and chronological lines of time for motivating and doing that research. I remember sensing and getting frustrated by the limitations of writing, explaining and engaging with concepts to express my curiosity. My curiosity has always been intertwined with research. My heart makes my head swim, Fanon 1952, as cited in McKittrick 2021. The tension and forced to express in words and written language are examples of how meaning is validated only with academic language about relationality during my master's research i was told theory first methods after analysis later a fixing of time for the pre-constructed steps of research like the cement of a building i can still smell the concrete of buildings at the university where i completed my master's research the smell and touch remind me of the impenetrable boundaries of academic fields of research, concrete walls of time and the silencing. Humanist research framings depend on research being conducted using human optics as the means to decide what is present and or not present, thereby ignoring the multiple temporalities and entangled fluid relations across and through time and space. This humanist framings legitimize erasure and exclusion of particular bodies, e.g. children, brown bodies, more than human bodies. Of disembodied sensations and relations with time and space demarcate those thoughts and responses that are welcome in the making of student time, leaving behind the times of this university's exclusion of brown and black bodies. We're all students, all free to attend in post apartheid South Africa. 
free because our skin is no longer used as an apparatus for exclusion from this university. I am able to register to study my father. They're more sorry, sorry. I, can't, I can't see. Yeah, it. yeah, there is. Well, I'm just trying to move it. So I, oh, uh, there we go. Can you see the top? My father was able to study here for three months until there were complaints about his race classification. I walk on the ground where he and so many were illegal bodies. The fixed lines reinforce bounded lines of individual bodies in research. They place the researcher, research participants, environment and research methods as separate. In other words, what is at issue here is once again, a gentle separability, differencing without othering, without separability, without exclusion. Binaries and dominant humanist views of the world limit research possibilities through its westernized understandings of relations. This is seen in the way binaries separate nature and culture, theory and method, school and home, adult and child and time and, and place. These research practices assume that bodies are bounded, individual entities that exist separately and prior to their relations with others. For example, place, sorry, go for it. Um, relations do not follow relata, but uh, the other way around. This means that the relata do not pre-exist bodies, do, sorry, relata do not pre-exist. Bodies do not pre-exist, but are made through interacting relations. Bodies are relata, not individual entities. With others, for example, place, time, memory, more than humans, and water. During my master's research, I wasn't ready to fix my curiosity to the bounded field of education. Education is always already entangled with other fields and disciplines. What if trust? transdisciplinarity is always already how the world works. Would we as researchers be able to see disciplines in their specificities as an academic boundary making practice? In particular, being, ma being materially entangled means that to ask after the limits of the epistemological field alone is not sufficient. What is needed, as I have argued, is an ethical onto epistemology. Um, that created a stream of research called primary education. This university operates with streams as structures, for example, curriculum studies, primary education, mathematics education, science education. The building's paperwork, staff, coursework, and research streams are some of the material ways that direct the process of becoming a student within an individual stream. These streams, Water along the blay, marshy body of water where I live does not submit to human made borders. It flows through them or over them and makes different ones. The water leaks through and over the tidal pool walls, which makes me think about how borders aren't fixed in time and space. Have, have you have the IH degree? In that's my <laughs> seven-year-old. I'm in a meeting and I'm reading. You can have ice cream. I can't help you right now. You can have ice cream. Can please. you say hello to everyone in the room first? Hello. <laughs> uh -huh. Khalil, you can have ice cream. Can we have ice cream? Not before <laughs> supper, I'm sorry. It's about leaking time. Not right now, but you can. I've got another 20 minutes. I'll see no. you later. No, Shana, no, Guys, someone else has to cream. start reading. Okay. Sorry. Thanks, Thank Anya. I'm happy to carry on. Although... <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, where were we? Uh, where were we? So, uh, the buildings. Okay, so we can do the streams. Sorry, Ogdana, were you reading? Did you finish that? I did. I did. Yeah. yeah, sorry. The streams have, sorry, and then have borders and fixed lines. Some of these fixed lines are teaching and learning in primary schools and theories of child related to developmentalism, individualism, and social constructivism. I found myself trying to swim inside the bounded lines of the academic world that foregrounded learning and teaching related to school, a physical place where children go to learn, more concrete walls of classrooms, fences, and borders. 
Schools are places where time has many different names, such as class time, free time, on time, assessment time, even travel home for homework time. These times do not exist in the physical location of school in time. These times are training to fit into the framework of institutional time of a university. These times are thick with assumptions about progress and determinacy. Mm. Oh, sorry. Um, but these categorize, I'm, <laughs> I'm reading. These categorizations produce academic writing where the language is universal and English. Black ink on white paper, font size is uniform, sentences are organized, coursework and lectures are fixed in chronological time. Corrections through spell checks and the ongoing editing to keep paragraphs logical and contained. Labeling images in assignments erects a boundary. Um, if we just scroll down, sorry. Oh, I sorry, I'll try and lift it up a little. Um, this boundary is visible in the ways that academic papers and writing use text. Working within these constraints, the strike through performs as an invisible presence of the labeling of images as separate to the text. Between the written text and the visual image, which affects the relations. I resist the boundary of placing figure names embounded in text captions and bring them into the footnotes, which alerts the reader to the spaces that are part of this chapter, but not bound by text. Between text and image, submissions are due in linear time and measure knowledge. My hand. I just did a, that a few minutes ago. I can do the shortcut with such ease. How can I manipulate these boundaries of chapters to make them permeable and porous? Follows by regularly clicking tools, then word count. <laughs> That's back to you, Anya. <laughs> to see whether I am within the boundaries of the rules of length of text. How do these boundary lines of categorizations, practices and disciplines reinforce erasure for students who embody colonial legacies of South Africa? I respond to this question by returning to the university library entangled with research time, place, and hauntologies. Jack Derrida suggests Derrida suggests hauntology, which is a play and disruption of the world of the word ontology, which in French sounds like hauntology. This concept of hauntology comes into being through the indeterminate relationship between now and then, absent and present, alive and dead. Ontology for Derrida is an ongoing conversation with the ghosts of the past. The aim of this conversation is to invent a different future rather than fixing the past. Um, the sorry, the library, a central building on the university campus, books organized, ordered, purchased and arranged for academic fields. Scanning a student card gives access. My student card hangs around my neck a blue lanyard with a university branding on it. I have permission. The lanyard is a skin because it makes my bodily organs feel less vulnerable when I wear it. My computer is very sensitive. Okay, let me, oh, I know what, it's because of, oh, geez, sorry. Ooh, no. Okay, we are, we'll move in a second. <laughs> we'll move in a second, thank you. When I enter the education building and attend particular lectures, the skin means I can enter through the door, sit on the chair and speak. It soothes the memory of erasure. Erasure is a material practice that leaves its trace in the very worlding of the world. To have this additional skin. This lanyard skin doesn't work in the same way for using my access at the library. The steps towards the library feel far too far from the education building and the ground is less familiar, the embodiment of wanted time stirs my body. Figure T2 between the shelves under erasure, 9th of April, 2018. Going to the university library with my supervisor, we were nearing the end of my master's thesis and there were books that she was telling me about that lived on the shelves of the university library. It didn't take long before I revealed that I haven't actually been able to go there by myself. This memory returns as one that speaks about the structures of academic worlds that draw in other relations, even though it does not necessarily register them. Thanks, Bogdana. Okay, I think um, and now 
chronological time is slightly racing away from us. So I'm going to ask us to just think about um, that kind of where we are with what your Anne's shared with us through her writing, through her thinking and words and feelings. And anybody want to make a comment about this section on concrete time that we just read? Yeah, there are a couple of things that stand out. I mean, especially because where I'm at right now, I'm very much in the writing phase of my, my research. So on page 94, where she talks about, I was told theory first, methods after, analysis later. You know, that's something that I've been playing with. And I hadn't actually read this when I decided that for the paper I'm currently writing, I don't want to do it that way. I am shuffling um, the way we're taught to write so um yeah that stood out for me and then I really like and it resonates with me on page 95 where she talks about the streams these streams have borders and fixed lines and the footnote of streams um a lot of the work or I've written a paper now for ellipsis on um, tidal pools as containers and so yeah, again, um, this understanding of a container and, and what it means more, more of, you know, not concrete boundaries around, um, you know, a border not seen that way, seen as more leaky, you know, and mm -hmm. as um, permeable or porous. So yeah, those are, and then of course, hauntologies is something else that I'm also, very interested in so it's been very useful to have this paper and yeah. and and all of these papers in fact you know uh diffracting with barad and bringing new understandings of what diffraction means in in different contexts absolutely thanks um there's a there's a kind of um uh, leaking across in a way with the concrete for me mm. um where joanne talks about the well she talks about the the, the you know the ordering of the the uh the, the research and the the theory the the data then the analysis being like this uh building you know with foundations and solidness and mm. uh structure and then um i know you know looking at adrian's uh text and those images of like the whaling station mm. kind of old the, the 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 kind of ruins of concrete structures that have been kind of used to do such violence mm. um i don't know i don't know i'm not sure what it means um how to think about libraries and whaling stations um, as part of a part of a you know a swarm of I suppose colonial um, dominance, but the one is working with knowledge and the other's working with um, you know ocean bodies and and extraction, you know. I mean, is, can I ask her, is, it, is the one working with knowledge? <laughs> the libraries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? I mean, which, I was also which working one is, with Which one is knowledge. working with Eurasia? The, the, the violence and extraction of the whaling. No, the violence and extraction of academia, you mean? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yes. Mm, okay. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's... Yeah, I mean, just diffracting through what you're talking about. Uh, sorry, Betty, you go ahead and then I'll jump afterwards. No, I I have a comment on the images because um, I didn't know, Adrian. So there's a lot of the comment was like, I knew, I, I, I walked yeah. with, I saw it. And so I didn't know who this human was. I didn't know. And so I, it's, 
and I was watching, I was reading the text through my Adobe because I, I couldn't see it, it was okay. too small on the on the Zoom. And then I, was, I, I pushed it across and all of a sudden I saw that you were cutting across all the images. I'm like, oh, the images. <laughs> and it struck me because I didn't understand the first section. Mm. So photo mediation, it's like, it's like okay, I, okay, that's a concept, great. But like, where's the image? Mm. The image is everything in that, you know. And I, uh, I'm liking to the fact that if, if it is about leaking, um, and it's about footnotes. That was straight away, and there's a there's a there's a there's a there's this sort of um, straight away um, diffractive process that's happening. But the image is powerful. Like, where's the image at the beginning? Like, I you know, if I see the image, and I'm like, oh, it's about the whale station, you know, and it carries such you know, look at that. That's that's just ridiculous. Um, but I didn't understand that until we saw that. And when you see it, now you're going, okay, now I understand a little bit of what, what she's trying to say, because I didn't know the, I didn't know the story. Mm. That makes any sense. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I mean, that is the, I suppose the difficulty of saying, okay, let's, I mean, we're so constricted by time in this Zoom, because we're sort of starting at the beginning. And I was also thinking, you know, the other parts that we should be getting to how, but that's part of, it's a taster, and you will go off and read this, you know, <laughs> yeah. deep when you and, and be at the book launch so you can learn and see these in color probably through i've just them. i've just outed myself as someone that didn't read the paper before the, no, meeting, before the session <laughs> we extend a lot of grace to people <laughs> to the people and the more than humans in the room who can or cannot do the things we think we could do so yeah it doesn't certainly we're not supposed to and reading it together is different to reading it on our own and reading it in this i mean look at that reading it in this particular way so mm -hmm. yeah Thanks. Um, and certainly, Joanne, to your, your comment about erasing your, having the line through your work to include, you know, really this work of the methodological work of, well, I suppose in your piece of disrupting this idea that these are the words that matter and that's the text. These are the words that matter and these are the much smaller. I see you even had a bold footnote. I mean, I really like that on the first page. This, you know, it's, it's the stuff we notice about how we're trying to disrupt these concrete borders and boundaries that are not actually concrete because concrete is made of water and I don't know exactly but water and sand mostly um and kind of thinking about what that means I was I keep thinking about this idea I mean I, I'm at UCD I'm in that space um today we didn't start lectures because our students were protesting and so again this disruption that is always happening it's not only happening when the students are disrupting they, their lives are disrupted by the financial exclusions etc cetera, etc cetera. so this idea that there's always this leaking that we ignore actually and and erase and we talk about Barad talking about the void well we read that part with Adrian about the void being I mean it's not that it's nothing that's exactly the point um sorry so I'm just I'm aware of time we have it's 20 minutes one minutes past five and maybe just should we go back to reading a bit more of Adrian's? We could actually also read the images, but I suppose it yeah, will help. I, I just said, I also had a comment now, just listening to, to um, the discussion, you know, and I love that playful work there. Well, it's not playful in a, in a dismissive sense, but a sort of real conscious sense of concrete where, you know, concrete ruins as in buildings of whaling stations or concrete ruins that are still very, you know, physical, the buildings look fine, but they're also ruins, you know. Yeah. Um, and then that was quite interesting for for me. I think it's quite generative to think about the the um the beauty of ruins in that we're not decentering something and then putting something else in its place, but about living a, across the living and the dying and the, you know, and not trying to set up another another binary of concrete time or unconcrete yeah. unconcrete or destructive time or whatever it is but but almost being just thinking about Adrian's work as well of like the ontological the materiality that is so rich in its articulation because it's it's not divorced or, or like sort of set up and then something else replaces it or yeah it's it's entrenched in a in a beautiful way like like concrete foundations are you know even if plants take over and, and the humans disappear but it's still yeah it's still echoing there whether it's, it looks physically sound or not um yeah so I just appreciated that that discussion because it, it really 
made concrete travel across both both chapters for me, which was quite quite nice. Absolutely. So maybe just to hear some of Adrian's Adrian's self, not her voice, but her her being. We could maybe, if I could make a suggestion, just start because we just spoke. I spoke a little bit about the void, but maybe this section two, where, where we start with Barad stresses. I mean, are people? Can we just start? Just read that section. It's on page twenty one hundred and eight. Um, mm. Just a little bit further on from where we were, and in the section called Ultramarine, which is, can I just suggest to everybody? It's really beautiful. When I hadn't thought about all the ways that Ultramarine actually works as a color, and she, Aiden does it really well in this chapter. She brings it in in, in quite a few different ways. But um, is somebody willing to read from Barad's stresses, and then we'll have maybe two or three minutes to do a little bit of work after that. I could choose someone because <laughs> we're running out of time. Barry, please, could you start? Where please? was it? Sorry, where is it? Sorry, uh, one, 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 I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy, happy to, to do it. Okay, okay, go. Barad stresses that in Newtonian philosophy and classical physics, the void is that which literally doesn't matter. Understood in terms of absence or lack, thus devoid, the void enables the rendering of spaces as empty rather than plentiful, a well worn tool used in the service of colonialism, racism, capitalism, militarism, imperialism, nationalism, and scientism, and justifies practices of, of erasure and avoidance. Oh, nice. This includes making spaces uninhabitable for their more than human inhabitants. Barrard's nuanced explorations of the nuclear military industrial complex, so central to the workshop troublings, have rich resonances with the intertwined extractivist and military histories of the coastal and island spaces of southern Africa and the sub and Antarctic and the waters of the South Atlantic, South Indian and Southern Oceans. Today, for example, the South African coast is still reluctant is still reluctant host to a nuclear power station, weapons testing facilities, landfills, mining operations, and in a twist on the deep implication of the whaling industry in 20th century warfare, former whaling stations that become the sites of several military training bases. Ultramarine is the color of the carbon paper in moth-eaten shipping notebooks. How lovely is that? The handwritten <laughs> undercopy lists where alongside rations of rice, cigarettes, socks, pickled onions, jam, coffee, vinegar, the traces of thousands upon thousands of penguin eggs, seal skins, shark livers, and bags of guano and phosphophatic sand remain. It is the color of duplicate invoices and tallies, custom papers, leasehold applications, concessions, lengthy correspondences and decoded telegrams in musty, overfull archive boxes, detailing the minutiae of imperial and state control over cetacean, pinnipped and avian bodies and body parts. I feel like I didn't say those words right. But ultramarine is also the color of sea changes and being at sea, of submersion saturation and drowning it is the color of the shifting horizon of which i try to steady my gaze but struggle to focus and of Fata morgana where beguiled by temperature inversions matters are warped overturned doubled up conjuring seasickness ultramarine is the color of yearning of the ocean as unwell and out of breath and of the untimely visceral retort that remains me reminds me that i too am a body of water I am indebted to Estrida Nehemanis' powerful figurations of bodies of water. Movement and perception are out of joint, disoriented, disordered, incongruent, nausea, vomiting, and vertigo are unstoppable, uncontainable. To be unstable, mismatched, exposed, to be turned inside out. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. So um, ask, ask, can I ask the question why we haven't um, diffracted ultramarine through teal? We just have, so what do you mean we have? <laughs> if we will, this is the moment. <laughs> we have, we have. But what are you talking about? We've been doing it since like, where have you been? We've been doing it from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, all, all I want to say is that we are doing the impossible, which is the forward slash the M forward oh. slash 
call today. It is not possible to understand all of Joanne's work and all of Aiden's in this hour and also to do justice, but time and justice actually are, <laughs> are working with us. But I think that in that is, is the gift as well as the problem that, you know, this makes you me want to read them both, but makes you want to go back to read these chapters. And I really would encourage all of you. I mean, uh, the parts that are very beautiful in everybody's work and also just the last sentence of Adrian's work um, and certainly we can also go back to yours Joanne is she writes in this offering you know that law I sit with them and touch them she's talking about the decaying bodies sorry I don't have to read that I'm just saying maybe we should read I, I think you should read it but just, but just quickly on the bottom of 99 mm -hmm. 29 teal the chapter is teal Teal is a, okay, okay, okay. And a contamination of multiple colors, an unbounded becoming of writing. It refuses to settle for the boundaries of academic writing frameworks, but instead lives within the frameworks and changes them. It is porous like the gathering of kelp, water, salt, and watery bodies. Wonderful. What, what footnote was that, Teresa? Just can you say it again for the recording? Number, footnote 29. 29 thank you oh. but note 29 for the recording thank you and there we are doing the work of the teal and the ultramarine so it is 5 30 um and we <laughs> have the other stuff that we need to do in our life there's ice cream to be had and suppers to be made yeah. and yeah. no cheating to happen can i and can i call the call the exit <laughs> please yeah, yeah. um what a privilege uh for, for multiple reasons and an indeterminate list from my side as yeah just being able to sit and and listen to to this work being read out loud so I leave you with the last two sentences at the end of my chapter chapter teal page 103 to do this researchers are called upon to be a part of creating leaks in the borders of institutional time and personal time which includes ice cream and writing and footnotes and <laughs> word count. We have to work diffractively with time and play closer attention to what is often excluded. The concrete smells different. It's leaking. It sure does smell different for me today. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> yeah. you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jan. Thanks all the very best. We hope to see you all on the 25th at the book launch. We hope to continue the work that this book does, chooses to um, create an effect change in our lives, the work of the children, the people, the animals that we are with. So thanks everyone for being here, for your graciousness in terms of just being part of the stop and share and share and stop. And Joanne, it was lovely to have you here and we look forward to reading more about all your work. Anya, all the best. Keep going, everyone. That's um, <laughs> Keep going, yeah. Time is leaking. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye. I'm going to end Bye. the meeting. Take care.